This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 397, was produced on October 12th, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. Hante Investments fund manager Alex Garevich returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the reasons Alex is still committed to the long duration trade, at least in the long term, and why that trade hasn't been performing so much recently in the short term. We'll also discuss the longer term crude oil market outlook. And I'm Patrick Ceresna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, October 11, 2023. The S&P 500 December futures were up 261 basis points, closing at 4409. Markets are finally mean reverting some of the previous week's very oversold state. We'll take a look at that chart and the technical levels to watch in the postgame segment. The U.S. dollar index down 98 basis points to 105 spot 72. The dollar has put in a short term swing high and is now consolidating November WTI crude oil contract down 87 basis points, closing at 83.49. We'll take a look at that chart in the post game with Eric. Uh, the November Arbob gasoline futures up 45 basis points to 221. Prices settling down after last week's volatility. The December gold contract up 283 basis points, closing at 1887, uh, quickly retracing 50% of the losses from their September weakness. Copper up 56 basis points to 361 uranium down 157 basis points to 69 dollars even the u.s 10-year treasury yield down 18 basis points closing at 456 yields sharply reverting the very strong advance from september the key news to watch this week is that university of michigan consumer sentiment number and next week are the retail sales unemployment claims and the start of earnings season this week's feature interview guest is Hante Investments Fund Manager Alex Gurevich. Now, Eric, why did we get Alex back on the show this week? Well, Patrick, I've been asking most of our recent uh, feature interview guests, hey, what if Alex Gurevich turns out to be right about his conviction on the long duration trade and eventually moving back to negative interest rates? Well, needless to say, it would be pretty silly to ask that question without verifying that Alex still has the same views that he had last time we interviewed him. And his views, I think, have actually changed a bit. And I think you'll be interested to hear that Alex's views have changed, at least with respect to the short term and why he admits his team got a few things things wrong, but he's still committed longer term to the long duration trade. Well, Eric's interview with Alex Garevich is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Hante Advisors founder, Alex Garevich. Alex, I'm really looking forward to this one. Before we get started, I just want to salute you, sir, because it is so refreshing to me seeing so many people in this industry hiding from their mistakes and not admitting when they screw things up. Your most recent research note, which most people would only send to their research customers, you've actually shared with the whole world, and it starts in the very first paragraph by saying, hey, we got some stuff wrong, and we got some stuff right almost, and we need to talk about what we got wrong. It is just so refreshing to me to see someone with that much honesty and candor directly uh, address their clients and everyone else and acknowledge when some of their calls didn't work out, which always happens in this business. That research note is linked in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, click the red button above Alex's picture that says looking for the downloads. So what'd you get right? What'd you get wrong? And what happened with the stuff that went wrong? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, thank you for having me and thank you for your kind words. It's good to be back. The world is um, indeed somewhat different from how many of us have imagined it even a little while ago. And this note was ra- written in the spirit of like me contemplating what it is that I have learned over the last couple of years. And in this note specifically, I focused on understanding the persistent nature of inflation. That is, if I ask you, Eric, one question, what would you like to know if I asked you 
what do you think the inflation is next month? And I can give you only one piece of information about this, of all the economic numbers. Do you know what that would be? I don't mind, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have something coming to the top of your mind? It's got to be the macro voices inflation outlook from, uh, from Patrick's macro scoreboard. I can't imagine anyone using anything else. Okay, well, you have a great answer. Thank you. Uh, well, so my answer to this question would be, what is the inflation today? The best predictor of inflation next month is the level of inflation this month, right? Like, say we don't know anything about the economy. What would clue us in into what kind of inflation we are running? Well, the current inflation, right? And that's probably we're going to run something close to the current inflation next month, right? So inflation is a very big input into inflation. Does it make sense? In the whole math mathematical theory of dynamic systems, there are systems in which the current state is input into the, the future state. And when that is the case, it creates very often very chaotic and very nonlinear situations because they could be self-reinforcing or self-arresting. And I think one of the things that I've discussed in the know that I did not quite fully appreciate is the self-reinforcing nature of inflation. So what happened is that I totally saw inflation jumping up, probably not as high as it did because I didn't know how high the supply problems would be, but it was very much in line with what Team Transitory would have thought inflation. There wasn't post-COVID growth shock and inflation shock. We got that right. Then uh, next, it unwound, and it did unwind in 2022. We had unwind of growth. We had unwind of that original supply shock. And as I discussed in the note, I don't want to repeat everything word to word, but that had nothing to do with policy because policy did not and could not have yet affect inflation because policy in 2022, real rates were still negative. They could not possibly be arresting inflation. Inflation got arrested because of the unwind of the post-COVID shock. However, that period of 2021 of extremely loose policy created a positive feedback in the inflation process. And inflation persisted, got higher than we thought, or I thought persisted a little longer than I thought. And the thought I put forward in that note, if, if I was wrong this way, it is likely people will be wrong the other way. And the deflationary shock that we're experiencing when inflation bull whipped away from that um, high levels will be also more persistent and sticky. And just as in 2021, it was inflationary shock was reinforced by extremely loose policy. In 2023, the deflationary shock will be reinforced by extremely tight policy, the policy that is we're watching now, not just in terms of rates, having reason, I mean, everybody like the financial Twitter is full of charts, how like the worst bond performance since 18th century or whatever. So rates have reason, but also we're seeing a quantitative tightening happening and the reversal of treasury cash supply coupled with strong dollar. And now the commodities are wobbly and the equity markets are wobbly. So all of those things create tightness. If you want to talk about financial conditions, you can call it tightness of financial conditions. I prefer just to talk, talk about policy tightness. And even on the fiscal frontier, we're seeing some reversals. But so my thesis is, just to summarize it, that just as we were blindsided by persistence of inflation, now people could be blindsided by persistence of deflationary cycle. So you still think that the deflationary cycle that you described is still coming? It's just delayed? Or do you think that the deflation itself is going to be overshadowed by this self-reinforcing aspect of inflation that you just described? Well, I think it is coming. I think the recent data, confer, uh, in anything, tells me that it's going to be much deeper and much more catastrophic than even like what we were looking at a year ago. Because... We got to much tighter levels on policy that one could have suggested. And that stickiness will actually, I, in, I, in my opinion, will lead to much longer and more severe deflation throw than if we had like a quick inflation, deflation, bull, bull whip. That stickiness, I think, will show itself strongly on the other side. The timelines have shifted into the future, but the timelines and what the timelines will do they might create a lot of uncertainty. And I will talk about risks to my view because, first of all, I always like to say this thing. is like when I pound my table and say, this is what's going to happen. This is absolutely unavoidable economic outcome. 
What I really mean is there are 52% chance of that outcome. And I think we both know that, that everything is probabilistically, we're just looking for an edge. So we talk with a lot of confidence so we can put positions on, but every what are all we're really talking about the edge. And there is very serious risk to this deflationary outlook, and I'll discuss which ones there are if, uh, further on. But uh, in my opinion, what is forming is a much slower grinding but eventually precipitating deflationary bust with various secular factors that could overlay and work in different directions, depending on timeline, either to reinforce it or to soften it. Now, I could interpret that either of a couple of ways. One way would be to say that what you're forecasting specifically is deep deflation, and that's going to you know cause the bust, if, if you will. And in that case, if, if you really think that deflation is what's coming, okay, that, that's one view. Another way to look at it is, is to say you're expecting a, a recession or depression to occur, which you expect will have deflationary characteristics. That would make me wonder, well, wait a minute. If it turns out that this inflation is even more self-reinforcing than you think, is there a scenario where you still have the big recession or, or you know, super recession or even uh, mild depression that, that you were previously predicting, but it turns out to be an inflationary recession or depression because of that self-reinforcing uh, phenomenon? Is that a possibility or is that really not jibe with the reasons that you are anticipating deflation in the first place? Well, personally, I think of the latter as a unlikely scenario because I think where we have the disagreements, I see right now already deflation. I see inflation trending down on all frontiers. Like right now, I don't think we're anymore in the cycle of self-reinforcing inflation. We're in a cycle of self-reinforcing disinflation. Now that could change. And again, we can discuss the reasons why that could change. But the zeitgeist that I see right now is a self-reinforcing disinflation. So uh, to me, like, Self-reinforcing inflation is already a thing of the past. In order to think of inflation being a problem, you have to, in my opinion, you have to think up of already a new cycle. Inflation is trending down. And as rates are going up, and what really matters is the real rates. And the real rates shot up tremendously over the last, like if you're talking about nominal rates shock, but was big, but real rates shock is insane. We went from like negative 9% real rates to positive 2.5% real rates. That's like 11.5% rise on real rates. And that is, to me, very relevant to the first part of your question. What do you think is the chicken of the egg, right? What do you think? I think the question was, what is the chicken of the egg, of the egg recession or deflation? Is that correct? Yes, because I was under, trying to understand what the driver was so that I could understand whether there was a possibility of a flip to an inflationary version of the same thing. And it sounds like you're saying, no, your, your prediction is not recession and it might be inflationary or deflationary. Your prediction is a continued disinflation and that's where the recession comes from. So therefore, you don't see a resumption of inflation as part of this uh, outlook. Well, I, obviously, and, and again, I want to talk about why I could be wrong on this, because there is a very specific thing that worries me, how I can be wrong. That specific thing wouldn't have to do with uh, a little bit of geopolitical upset in the last several days, would it? I indeed see the risks coming from geopolitics and politics broader. But let me first explain what I mean, uh, as you say, by deflation or disinflation leading the way. There was another, in the note, I focused on how we were wrong about self-reinforcing nature of inflation. But there is one more thing that I was wrong about, which I did not quite address on the note because it it was focused on different things. It is employment. So I think the key employment will be the key to the cycle. Employment, what is driving the current resilience, really tight labor markets and labor markets which have structurally changed after COVID potentially, are what driving the rise in real wages, tightness of labor, strong performance of consumers, strong retail sales, corporations being resilient, being able to raise their prices in response to the inputs being more costly. Now, all those things, if I say, would sound like, why am I not in the inflation camp? And this is where my soul searching, financial searching led me to understand about employment. Post-COVID, I had this idea that employment, just overall amount of job of jobs available will drop. 
my thought was that people who were on s- stimulus checks and were not working will all want to come back to work when stimulus checks will run out and find the jobs are not there for them. I thought so, and this was not my expert opinion. That was my layperson speculation. And this is a warning shot to all of us, not to use your layperson speculations for your market positioning. Use your expert opinions. So my layperson speculation is that, look, there are a lot of redundant jobs out there. During COVID, companies managed to do without a lot of workers and keep the economy running. And now they will find out they don't need all those people, that they can run things much more efficiently and much fewer personnel will be needed. And people will just not find their jobs waiting for them. However, exactly the opposite happened. The jobs were waiting, but people did not come. One could argue that job numbers ha- have become more mixed over the last few months. We're not seeing like a job boom anymore. Like we're getting this like, oh, okay, unemployment rate, uh, headline ticking up and now ticking down and ticking up. However, unemployment is ticking up. JOLTS numbers are ticking up and down, but claims numbers are holding at the pretty low levels. There are lots of mixed indications on employment. However, there is no yet employment bust. And that was a good lesson to me. And it goes back to my point about what drove inflation. Those layperson considerations, oh, companies can probably get rid of redundant personnel, are being overridden by simple economic realities. And the economic realities was, of 2021 was extremely negative real interest rates. When real rates are extremely negative, when the funding for the companies is cheap, they will not make a push to raise productivity and reduce their personnel. Rather, they will just try to sell as much stuff as possible. So they will be hiring like crazy because they can raise prices. And because real wages were not were negative in 2021, 2022, so why not hire more people? There was no pressure on anybody to slim down. And that very basic economic consideration that negative real rates are not good for productivity. In fact, that even shows over the last decade, we had abysmal productivity growth, as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, and in the environment of really low real rates. Now the real rates are going up. There are all sorts of reasons why people say that, oh no, the labor markets will stay tight, the companies are doing well, the earnings are doing well, they can keep raising prices. But the point is that in America, which could distinguish it from Europe, because in America, companies have certain bloodlust, certain search for profits. And in the environment of positive real rates, it will become less profitable for companies to employ redundant labor force. And even as labor might have the power to negotiate higher wages, in some sense, it must backfire at some point because companies will just start employing less and less people as real wages going up and demand higher and higher productivity. Interestingly, we just got a lot of new tools to increase productivity. And like with artificial intelligence, in general, there are a lot of tools to increase productivity and reduce labor force. And I think that process has to happen. Now, people may ask me, why we're not seeing it now? And my answer to this is we could not be seeing it yet. We could not be seeing it yet because of the timeline. The real rates have not gone positive till second half of 2022. Everybody was talking about rates going up in 2022, but they were still, real rates were still negative. There was no real tight policy in 2022. It was tightening, but it was not tight. Now, only recently we've had what could be called a tight policy. So we're going to have to wait and see if employment will weaken, which I think it will. And that's my strong prediction. Alex, I want to come back to the inflation and deflation prediction, because it seems to me that there's something everybody has to agree on. And then there's something that, you know, it's a matter of subjective opinion and nobody can prove. And my contention is this. Obviously, there's a supply chain driven spike in inflation that was entirely about the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic is over. That is retracing. That is going away. It's never going to come back. I'm sure everybody could agree on that. The question then is, was that wave on the ocean a wave all by itself? Or was that wave actually formed on top 
of a longer period, perhaps shallower wave, which is a new secular inflation trend, which, yeah, we, we're going to come off of whatever it was, 7%. Maybe we're going to go back down to 4 or 5%. But we're not going back down to 2% because there's a new secular inflation. That's one view. It happens to be my view. And there's another one that says, no, 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 everything we're seeing here is just the unwind of that supply chain pandemic-driven thing. And we are going back to 2%, maybe even well below 2% or negative. How could you possibly know that answer? And what can we do to figure out which one of those views is right? Honestly, we probably can't figure out right now who is going to be right at future will have to show, and arguments could be made on both sides. Now, as I just talked before about employment, I outlay the case why I think employment will weaken. And I think employment will be the key because we will not have really brought slowdown on economy and severe deflation until employment weakens. There is no reason. When employment is strong, real wages go up, consumers stay strong, just as I said before, everything will keep chugging along. I believe that if we do have this strong downturn in employment, we'll go back to the normal deflationary environment. And here is both the forecast and the risk to my forecast. Imagine the world with no governments and no wars, just kind of a world in which just markets rule. I think we would be heading to insanely deflationary world, like deflation on the scope that never happened in the history of humanity. We're about to have energy costs fall by a factor of a thousand. Fusion is just on the horizon. It's no longer like people kept talking about fusion being always the energy uh, which will be 30 years from now. Well, that's no longer the case. Fusion is almost there. I think fusion will be commercially viable in six, seven years. The improvements in fission reactors, the improvements in various forms of energy, they're pretty strong. Energy will always be in shortage. There will be no like one sweeping solution that energy is no longer a problem, but there will be deflation in the energy market in a decade. At least that's my view. Let's just stick with my view. AI will basically eliminate all intellectual jobs. It will not necessarily eliminate manual jobs because AI cannot like dig your garden. And I think our experience shows to make a robot to dig a garden is much harder than to make a robot that will write legal papers for you, like make a program that will write legal papers for you or solve math math problems for you or write poetry for you. So every intellectual professional will be displaced within one decade, essentially. So we're looking for tremendous changes, potentially. However, those changes may not come on the timeline of kind of free willing, free markets. There is a lot of politics and geopolitics going on in the world. And there is a lot of politics, and I'm not judging those politics. I am just saying that, the, to me, the political environment could be leading to secular inflation, and that could be the risk to my outlook. It's like labor unions are beginning to be, get stronger and negotiate. Maybe like I talked earlier about the companies reducing labor force, reducing the employment, maybe they'll, it'll be politically unviable for them. There could be various minimal wage regulations. There could be various, there could be basic income could replace employment and be another inflationary bump. There are so many different things that can happen in the world. On top of it, global instability just keeps pinching various supply lines here and there. So there is a lot of stuff that is happening, which is not, cannot be parsed by my economic forecasting. Let's talk about the developing situation in Israel and the Gaza Strip. We recorded this interview on Monday morning when information on casualties was still sketchy and unconfirmed. But early reports are that at least a dozen Americans were killed. If that proves true after the fog clears, it could lead to a significant escalation well beyond just Israel, Palestine, and the Gaza Strip. I'll have an update on this in the postgame segment, which will be recorded on Thursday morning and will include more current information for our listeners. Well, first of all, obviously the events of this weekend are truly terrible. And I just want to acknowledge that for many of us, including myself, they have emotional significance without whatever going into politics. I just want to say this. This is obviously a really shocking development of events. However, going back to my job and like trying to evaluate the geopolitical impacts, 
or rather impacts of geopolitics on the financial markets. For now, at this moment, it is hard for me to justify a lot of moves on asset prices based on those geopolitical events. For example, there is a jump in oil prices. I don't see immediate impact on um, oil production and oil supply in the world. Now, there are many ways you can game it. And there, I am truly a lay person. I can game it. Well, maybe Iran will end up being more sanctioned, isolated, or vice versa, maybe not. Maybe uh, Israeli-Saudi deal would be delayed, but maybe vice versa, in sympathy, it will be accelerated. There could be so many different ways to game it. For example, one of the first market reactions to that was a jump in U.S. Treasury prices. And as you know, I'm long duration. I'm betting on treasuries to go up. But how in the world is it supposed to help help treasuries in the long run? Wars are almost always incrementally inflationary. If U.S. gets dragged into another war, that's probably inflationary for U.S. But have a negative for budget situation, probably more supply and all this stuff, right? So I don't really know what all of this means yet, honestly. With oil, however, again, we could see it as bump in oil, but in the big picture, we had a conversation of about oil, you and I, uh, at the beginning of the year. And I talked about how I like to be long deferred oil instead of betting on specific front contracts. And this was interesting because if you were to bet on the front oil, there are so many times this year that you could have gone right or wrong. So if you did it right, you could have made a lot of money on upside moves in oil, even like re- recent months one, then you could have maybe like avoided the recent rapid sell-off in oil, then there is a bump again. But this is just recent history. There were several of those during the year. However, the deferred contracts is my preferred way to express it. And they were basically continuing to grind, grind up trading in much lower range. And my thesis on this, and it was my understanding, we talked about this, which is not so different. I think we're not so different in the opinion. Yes, in the long run, there will be various energy transitions and new sources of energy, but not tomorrow. Uh, I said earlier that I think fusion energy will be commercially viable pretty soon. Realistically, it won't be because of government regulations. And realistically, all the transitions and build up on the infrastructures would take time. And realistically, we're not prospecting for new fossil fuels probably enough to meet any kind of world growth world environment. So I think that in any environment, except if we hit a global depression, oil would, deferred oil, which gives offers an excellent discount, because if you go up two, three years, oil could get cheaper 15 or 20% depending on what day you ask. And that's just really a giveaway because why would forward oil two or three years from now be cheaper? Oil is not going to go out of style in two or three years, I think, by anyone's estimates. And the supply might be tightening. So this is purely market structure that creates a backwardation. And I think it's a great opportunity to take advantage of this market structure and continue and and watch this grind continue. I think energy prices will go up before they go down. And this is not like, generally, I don't like those kind of market predictions. Oh, I think this thing is going up, but on a short because of this or that, on a short run, I think it'll pull back. Usually I just go with long-term prediction, but there is a very strong structural situation going on with fossil fuels, which cannot be denied. And pretty much, I don't see anybody telling me otherwise. There is no controversy about this. I think uh, in any scenario except deflationary depression, risk rewards are skewed towards higher oil prices on a two, three year horizon. That's my opinion. I don't know. I assume that you agree with it. If you don't, let me know. Well, my view on that one is a little bit different. And the way I see this is if we have a continued demand for oil that continues around the level that it's at and it continues to test the limits of supply. We're looking at a a continued increase in oil prices, as you say, and a very significant risk that if we start to really test supply or if we see geopolitical escalation, 
the lack of elasticity could uh, could cause just a, a minor supply disruption to spike oil prices dramatically higher. So I think we probably agree on all of those things. The caveat that I have to throw in, though, is that the reason all those things can happen is as soon as you start to test the limits of supply, now that we don't have spare capacity in the system the way we used to, there's just not uh, room to really test the supply. But if we have the depression or, or significant recession that you're predicting look supply and demand works the same way as it always used to if there is less demand for oil than the current supply the price is going to go down at least for a while i contend that you won't be able to recover from that recession without getting into an oil crisis but the oil crisis i predict could be delayed by a couple of years if there's a deep recession well yes i agree with that part and this is exactly how my portfolio strategy works if there is a deep depression, I assume inter well, and I guess I could be wrong on that, but my assumption is that in that environment, interest rates will go dramatically down, and I will make money on the interest rate side, and then I'll just wait to make money on the oil side. If it's the other way around, and there is no immediate depression, I'll make money first on the oil side, and then wait to make money on the bond side. But that's kind of the key of my how I construct portfolio, my portfolio approach. I am not worried about depression, deflationary depression scenario, because in which case, oil, in, w- in which oil prices fall, because to me, that environment is the environment of zero interest rates. And there is a lot of money to be made as in many other situa- things. So whatever I make on oil, whatever I lose on oil will become pennies compared to what I can make on other things. Conversely, I can make significant amount of money on oil, because if you're talking about Oil going not to just a not to from ninety to hundred, but going to hundred fifty or two hundred. There is a lot to be made on oil. This is not pennies anymore. What I think I differ. Where I think I differ, given this current environment, I don't see oil prices as a risk to my long medium term deflationary outlook. I think oil can create obviously some headline inflation, and as we discussed earlier, inflation going up for any reason could cause more inflation because it feeds into other prices and then uh, these prices get fed to consumers and consumers uh, demand higher wages and it keeps spinning. However, I don't really think that that's where an environment when sharp oil shock will feed into defl- inflationary spiral. The reason is that oil trades in dollars, like it or not like it. And dollar supply in the world is getting scarce. Dollar is rising, dollar interest rates are higher. There is all sorts of liquidity draining operations like quantitative tightening going on. In that environment, when energy becomes more expensive and people have to pay in in dollars, which are also more expensive, it will just become contractionary for the world. So in some sense, yes, it might temporarily increase headline inflation, but I think it will accelerate eventually deflationary depression, and people will solve. So you see, if things are great, so if you're running a factory which requires a lot of energy and the energy prices are going up, everything is great and you have plenty of cash floating around, you borrow more cash and pay higher price for energy. If there is a shortage of cash, you shut down your factory or just change your operations to have dramatically low energy consumption. So I think a supply shock while demand is temporarily inelastic, it will become very quickly become elastic in this environment. So that at least my vision. So my vision is that, yes, if you're thinking of just pricing headline inflation for the few months, oil price is important. If you're thinking of long-term likelihood of deflationary depression or just in general, like kind of deflationary environment, losses to the job market, I don't think a spike in oil, oil supply shock over the next two years will um or di- supply disruption if you wish will negate my story if anything it might even reinforce it let's talk about the long term forecast for oil i think the things that we're in sync on is if you look in the short term if we dive into deep recession, hey, supply and demand is still supply and demand. Price of oil goes down because we're no longer testing the limits of supply the way we are now. Right now at this moment, people are scared to death that there might not be enough oil. We're almost tank bottoms in Cushing, Oklahoma to settle the next contract. If that stops being a fear, the price is going to go down. 
But I think we both agree that there's lots of reasons to expect over the next five years for the price of oil to continue to rise, and I think rise quite substantially. The place where I also agree with you but disagree with you, your outlook for uh, oil prices longer term, let's say 10 years out, to come back down for there to be energy deflation, um, you think that's going to happen because of fusion. I find it fascinating that you think that because uh, I've looked at it and I, I don't come to that conclusion. I think the same thing, that energy prices will come down radically starting in about 10 years, uh, but it'll be because of small modular nuclear reactors built on robotic assembly lines by me and a company that I want to launch. Uh, so whether it's fusion or uh, the way I want to do it, I'm not sure, but I think we do agree on that outcome. Is that right? And uh, what, what are your thoughts about what could disrupt that outlook or change it? Well, I think that the biggest headwind to this transition, whatever, whoever wins fusion, uh, fission, or some other um, renewable energy sources, their headwind is almost always uh, regulatory and political, because there is a lot of like, oh, we don't like nuclear energy going on in the world. And there is a lot of, sometimes it concerns are founded, sometimes, honestly, I think they're unfounded. In, for when we talk about this decade timeline, that's actually a pretty short timeline. It is possible it might take more than a decade to do the transition. My point about fusion is that technologically, it might be possible to trans, transmit to fusion in a few years. R from regulatory perspective, it's probably not going to happen. What I think is not taken to account by general projections is how much AI will uh, accelerate that process finding fusion and fission solutions and all designing all those things in the next few years. So technologically, a lot of things will become possible, but I don't think they will actually come to fruition as quickly as we would all like. Tell me a little bit more about what you see the role of AI being in defining nuclear fusion and so forth. Do you see generative AI evolving to the point where it can think up a better strategy than we can think up? Or is it more of we humans think up the strategy and say, hey, I want to come up with a, a set of blueprints for me that I can uh, that I can build against based on these specifications conceived by a human? Are we talking about what should be done is going to be determined by AI or just the speed of implementation once you know what a human determined goal is that the AI figures out all the details for you? Okay, so this is a long and interesting discussion. I think both is true. So my imagination is that one of the problems with stuff like any kind of nuclear systems, like fusion or fission, is stability. There is a lot of different factors, and you need to maintain control. So it's a control problem with potential chaotic dynamics involved. And it's a very difficult control problem. And I feel that like uh, new levels of AI can solve control problems much better than humans. I don't know how to go into that without going into a lot of math, but the idea, it's like when you see juggler juggling several objects, they don't make every throw perfectly. They have to do a lot of micro-corrections. And if anything goes off, the whole pattern dissolves and like all the balls will be down. So when you have a nuclear reactor, you don't want that to happen, right? So solving those safely controlled problems is, I think, will be made much easier by introduction of AI in the next few years. Alex, final question. I do want to come back to your long duration outlook, which you've had for several years. You've been uh, right for most of that time. Recently, uh, you know, as Lacey Hunt has said to me a few times, boy, when, when you're long duration and it, the market's moving against you, you, you can look uh, awfully embarrassed for a bit before you get proven right again. Uh, are you committed to the long duration trade? Yes, I'm still committed to the long duration trade. As I've, that was the thrust of my note. And since I wrote this note, it's one of those things. The trade got even better because bonds sold off quite a bit between August and early October. So now we're at even better levels. It is interesting. I was listening to your podcast with Jesse Felder, and I was mentioned to this podcast because he was talking, if Alex Gurevich was listening to that, he would say, no, you should be buying bonds. But he expressed concerns over the supply. And interestingly, supply did factor in over the last couple of months. When you have more sellers than buyers, things go down. It's that simple with treasury bonds. It's not about growth outlook or inflation outlook. I don't believe in any of this. Recently, 
what changes there was more sellers than buyers, more supply and it overwhelmed demand and prices went down and the yields correspondingly went higher. However, where I differ, I try not to forecast those short-term supply swings. Rather, I look what it does to long-term outlook. And the recent rise in rates, rise in real rates, increase in supply of treasury, which sucks other money out of the system and also drives dollar higher up. To me, this is all reinforces my policy outlook, which is eventually policy rates will have to go down and go down significantly as most likely to zero. Uh, the more of this supply comes in right now, the more interest rates go higher now, the more likely they'll lower to be later. Luke Groman told us last week that he sees what's going on here as the bursting of the global sovereign bond bubble. And he's saying it's just getting started. You know, we, we spent the last 30 years in a bond bull market. He, he thinks that it's topped and, and starting to blow off. Uh, is there, you know, what would that mean? And at what point would your commitment to the long duration trade have to be abandoned? I think probably what would make me question my thesis, as I mentioned before, it's political shifts. Right now, I see no sign of anything like that. Definitely, the 40-year bond bull market was all, is over, and it, and it was followed by recent three-year bear market. And I think this bear market will soon be over and will start new bull market. This is going to be not the same bull market that we had from the 80s. It's going to be a new bull market, which I think will be much more rapid and violent than the previous bull market. That's my central opinion. I don't think... Uh, sovereign, there is any burst of bubble. I don't think there is any crash of credibility of developed market bonds happening. I don't see any of that. Uh, as proven, for example, by the fact that dollar is getting stronger. So the more bonds sell off, uh, like you said, offer more bonds, but then it, they just clear at lower prices, but it just drives capital account surplus. Their inv foreign investors are putting more money into dollars as they get higher yields and dollar is getting higher. So I don't see any kind of credibility issue going on here. Alex, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about what you do at Hante Advisors. You run a hedge fund, which means your investments are available only to institutional and accredited investors. For people who do meet those qualification criteria, how do they contact you to get a hold of a tear sheet and a pitch book? So accredited investors can find me and qualified purchasers could Find us on the website, honteinv.com, so H-O-N-T-E-I-N-V.com. If you are qualified, you could uh, register on the website and get information, but there is a lot of publicly available information. Those notes, including the note we discussed now, would be available on that website and any other uh, research notes I've made public and any other information that is made public could be found on that website. I can also be found on X. A. Gurevich 23, like my first initial, my last name, and the number 23. Patrick Serezna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Energy Transition Crisis, my new video documentary series about energy transition, has finally been released, and anyone can watch it for free at EnergyTransitionCrisis.org. The series explains exactly what it's really going to take to break humanity's addiction to fossil fuels and why it will take longer and cost more than almost anyone realizes. And I'd like to think the three episodes on nuclear energy are among the most detailed on YouTube. This is a passion project for me, and there's no profit motive, no revenue, and therefore no budget other than donations. I'd really appreciate your help promoting the series. Things you can do to help include subscribing to the Energy Crisis Doc YouTube channel, liking every episode, posting comments on YouTube, and posting links to your favorite episodes on social media. If you don't have time to do those things, there's also a donations page at energytransitioncrisis.org. The money does not go to me. 100% of it will be spent on YouTube and other social media advertising to promote the series. Thanks in advance for your help. Now let's get back to the show and Patrick's post-game chart deck. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. 
Eric, was great to have Alex back on the show. Now, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to the chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Now, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, click on the red button over Alex's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's get to crude oil. EIA inventory was delayed by the holiday this week, but API, that's the private service that reports the day before, normally on Tuesday afternoon, and of course this week would be on Wednesday afternoon, API reported an utterly massive build of 13 million barrels of crude oil. Uh, That's obviously a very large build and would be significant if confirmed by EIA. But since we don't have EIA inventory this week due to the holiday, I'm going to comment on the developing situation in Israel and the Gaza Strait instead. This is, uh, I would say, the second biggest variant perception event for me in my entire career. The only time that my feeling that uh, I was very much out of sync with the market and disagreed strongly with what most market participants were doing was February of 2020. After uh, we had a January 30th, 2020 is when we told you to expect a global pandemic and uh, February was the month where everybody just shrugged it off and ignored it. And uh, I had to question myself. Am I getting this wrong? What the heck is going on? Uh, I I couldn't believe it. I was shocked this week to read a couple of different commentaries, and these are from professional analysts who ought to know what they're talking about. And the sentiment was essentially, okay, well, now that the fears of geopolitical escalation in Israel have pretty much blown over, oil is predictably correcting lower. They think this is over? Look, the Pentagon has already redirected the movements of aircraft carrier battle groups. This is anything but over. With at least 22 Americans confirmed dead as of Wednesday afternoon, we're following U.S. retaliation standard operating procedures to the letter. They're always completely silent about any intention of military retaliation until after the bombs have already landed. So if the U.S. intends to retaliate directly against Hamas, which is very likely considering the extent of American casualties, we won't find out about it until after it happens. Meanwhile, the Israeli escalation has been extraordinary, with more promised from Netanyahu. But more to the point, the real risk here is of a broader escalation of this conflict. As Alex said in the feature interview, there is no systemically important oil supply in Israel or Gaza. The most immediate risk is for some warmongering U.S. senator to start calling for airstrikes on Iranian oil fields because Iran reportedly helped to plan this attack. And, of course, Lindsey Graham won't miss any opportunity to call for another war. So he's already argued for doing exactly that. Meanwhile, presidential candidate Nikki Haley made even more incendiary comments that are certain to increase tensions between the United States and most of the Arab world. Before this event, Saudi Arabia and Israel were working to normalize diplomatic relations, and this clearly isn't going to help. So the risk of geopolitical escalation reversing this sell-off in crude oil remains extremely high. Whether, how, and to what extent the U.S. military joins Israel in a counterstrike against Hamas will be what determines how far this conflict spreads across the region. And that's a matter of when it happens, not whether it's going to happen. Aircraft carrier battle groups and guided missile cruisers have been redirected to the region. These are not the vehicles preferred by diplomats and peacemakers. Bottom line, this ain't over till it's over, and my sense is that this is still the calm before the storm. Obviously, Israel's response has been extraordinary, I would say unprecedented in its magnitude. I don't even think that's the worst of it. I think the U.S. is probably about to join in, and I think this is going to escalate into regional conflict. The risk to the oil market in terms of upside price risk is extraordinary. Now, there is still, of course, a recession risk, and with all these big Big builds in crude oil and finished products, okay, there is definitely a bearish argument if the geopolitical situation somehow magically just blew over and got forgotten about. That's not likely to happen, folks. I think the uh, skew is definitely to the upside in terms of risk. 
Remember those 100-strike calls on March 24 crude oil futures that I mentioned in last week's report? Well, they've more than doubled in price from the $0.66 they bottomed at, despite that the flat price has remained approximately the same. The reason is that oil volatility is back, and the market knows the upside tail risk is all too real. So I think that just like COVID, I'm going to be called a lunatic conspiracy theorist for focusing on the upside risk until the market wakes up to what should already be painfully obvious. A really big conflict just started in addition to the Ukraine conflict, and it could easily spread across the region. $150 oil is entirely possible, and risk is definitely skewed to the upside. The gap on the WTI chart has now been filled with this sell-off we had on Wednesday, and a daily close over the 34-day moving average at 86 spot 79 is the next signal I'm watching for as confirmation that the bull move is back on. But I don't think it's really going to be back on in earnest until more people wake up to what seems obvious to me, which is this situation that's just erupted geopolitically is not over and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, Eric, you know, I'm looking at this uh, chart on oil. I mean, we had a an amazing run from uh, just under $70 all the way north of $90 in a span of just uh, two months. And after such an advance, typically the rallies get checked and, uh, and some of these uh, inventory builds and things like this uh, certainly became a catalyst. But now, obviously, with the geopolitics, there's uh, uh, big, big variables into what technically can emerge. I I uh, really look at it that um, the backdrop can still be bullish on oil on the interim. And uh, and one of the things that uh, I'll be looking for is whether or not uh, we can beat from the highs from earlier this week and uh, and see whether or not uh, we can progress toward $90. If we start clearing and showing uh, the sequence of higher highs and higher lows, staying above all the moving averages, uh, that uh, may mean that the next window is open uh, for an advance that could even go up to a hundred dollars uh overall uh, while certainly a recession could uh, spur a, a sell cycle and a reversion i think when you look at uh with the way the economic data is rolling in here i think that a recession uh is not yet confirmed and so therefore oil may surprise everyone still with some further upside before uh, pulling back any further all right, uh, let's move on here. I want to get uh, Nick into this conversation. Nick, uh, on uh, page three, we have the S&P 500. Uh, what are the uh, option levels you're looking at here? Yeah, Patrick. So the current spot price of SPX is around 4380. We have a call wall just above at 4400, which also acts as key resistance, and a put wall below at 4300, which acts as key support. Now, the implied move for the October 20th OPEX, which is for next Friday, which is also a very key OPEX, is plus minus 80 points, which denotes a potential move to the upside of around 4460 and a potential move to the downside of around 4300, right near that support area that I just mentioned. Um, as I mentioned last week, I thought we'd see a pop off those lows toward the 4350, 4400 area. Um, we are, we're there right now. I don't see much more upside in the short term, but I could be wrong, obviously. Uh, I think we perhaps consolidate around here and then hit new lows over the next few months or so. What are your thoughts, Patrick? In principle, I agree with you, but the um, we were uh, we showed last week's charts uh, just how incredibly oversold the market was, and either it was going to be uh, a capitulating washout or just uh, like a elastic band stretched too far between two fingers, it's going to snap a little bit the other way. And so we had that reflexive rally to unwind the oversold state of the market. The interesting thing is is that uh, the dynamic hasn't changed. We see relative strength in the mag seven and the nasdaq and we see relative weakness in the small caps and the equal weight indices and things like consumer uh, defensive names and things like this have all just continued to do incredibly poorly and so the dynamic hasn't changed and so as we now have reached these retracement zones this is an area where uh, if this uh, sell-off is not over this is where uh, some short-term highs uh, can develop uh, to me uh, a breakdown back down below uh, 4300 on the S&P futures uh, on page uh, four is what I would be looking as indications that potential another round of selling may have uh, gotten underway. Nick, though, let's uh, ch- talk about the NASDAQ, which again, like I was saying, has shown a little bit of relative strength compared to the um, uh, S&P 500. What levels are you watching and what are you thinking here? 
Spot price right now on Qs is, is three seventy two approximately. We have a call wall above at three eighty and a put wall below at three sixty. The implied move for the October twentieth OPEX is plus minus eight points, where the upper expected move is right to three eighty, which is that call wall, uh, also acting as resistance too. Uh, and then below we have an expected move of three sixty four approximately. Support is at three sixty, then three fifty five. Um, again, tech really has dictated the moves in the market overall because we've seen the Mag Seven essentially take charge uh, to the upside or downside overall. Right now, we're seeing um, a number of the, uh, the large names back near their all-time highs, and that potentially denotes that we may have trouble pushing higher. But again, if we do break through key resistance areas, like if we get above 380, for example, we're only an earshot away from all-time highs at uh, at 408 roughly. So it's possible we get up there. I don't think it's going to happen, but that's my opinion right there. Well, you know, it's interesting. Like it would literally, uh, it w- it's Meta and Google that are the ones that just punched uh, to a fresh new high. So some of the other Mag Seven are strengthening, but they're not. They don't have that same momentum. But it just continues to demonstrate the, that the breadth of the market continues to narrow. And while maybe a bull impulse on these might be enough to cause the stock market, like on the queues, to go and double top or retest or at least hit its September highs, uh, I just don't know whether or not the market has the backdrop from which it's uh, going to make a fresh new high this calendar year. Odds are the highs of the market are probably uh, in for the year, but the quite bigger question is, does there, is there a more ominous drop that develops this year or is it a first quarter next year? Well, though on page uh, six, we have the VIX here, uh, Nick, and what was interesting to me is is that uh, this entire sell-off uh, where we gave back these three 400 S&P points over the last month and change, uh, it, we never saw volatility on any sustained basis get above 20. I mean, we stayed in the teens the whole time. Uh, just while certainly there was a spike in volatility premium, it's certainly nothing uh, that would typically uh, be associated with a, a, a key a swing bottom in a market for a sell-off of that magnitude. We're here at the 16 level. What are your, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, so right now with the VIX at around 16, this denotes that we should have average daily moves in the broad markets of about 1%. Um, we saw a spike back down from the 20 mark, again, because last Friday, uh, when we were at around 42.20 on SPX, near the lows, we saw a lot of put premium selling out of the money. So that kind of suppressed demand for puts, I guess. Um, and in, in that case, we saw also a, um, a counterbalance where we we saw a lot of buying of calls on zero DTE, which drove us higher on Friday. We went from a low of uh, 42.20 to a high of 43.25 approximately, which was also the second widest range we've seen all year on SPX, which is very interesting because you know the straddle prices were very underpriced at only about 25 points on Friday. So I've, no- I've noticed that over the past few days as well, the uh, the market's underpricing the moves by you know, based on the straddle price anyway, by watching the straddle price first thing in the morning, you're seeing that it's about 22 to 25 points. Meanwhile, we're getting a range of about 45 to, you know, 105 as of Friday, uh, which means that if you just buy, buy a straddle and you're directionally agnostic, you essentially win, right? Obviously, if it stays in the same spot, then you lose. But um, in the short term, what I'm seeing is, is uh, a lot of premium selling out of the money. Now, this gamma pin may unwind after next Friday's OPEX because a lot of the options will roll off, and then that may kind of open up a window for more volatility ahead. Now, moving on to page seven, we have the U.S. dollar index. What are your thoughts here? The Dixie peaked at 107 and is trading on a low 105 handle early on Thursday morning. Does that mean the top is in, or is this just a brief pullback before the dollar rally powers higher past 107? I think it's too early to tell, but at least the near-perfect straight-line ascent that we saw from early June through last week has finally been broken. Let's see what next week brings. Yeah, the overbought state of the dollar, Eric, uh, has created a bit of a pullback. But when, one of the technical things that we look for is uh, back in uh, March and in the, in the summer and June, uh, the dollar put in uh, um, highs and resistance at 104, 105. So now that we've cleared all of those major highs and uh, are now uh, approaching them, it often becomes support. And that's convenient that the 50-day moving average lies there. 
uh, I think we can easily go down still and test even uh, um, 105 or 104.50 on the pullback. But my my first inclination is that that will be a buy on dip and send uh, the dollar right back to its highs. But the question is, is that going to last for the rest of October or is it a quick dip that lasts just a few days? Uh, I'm, I'm in the buy on dip mode on this with a li- little bit of room for further weakness. So I'm looking for a little bit lower prices for the next buy. Moving on to page eight, we have the gold futures chart. Eric, what are your thoughts here? Gold was badly oversold before the Israel-Gaza event this past weekend, so the timing was perfect for this conflict to serve as a catalyst for an upside reversal. But now the question is whether it will last, because what we've seen in this gold market is that for the last couple of years, geopolitical events have caused spikes in gold that generally haven't lasted, even as the geopolitical event did last. So when we had the outbreak of the Ukraine war, There was a big spike up in gold, but even as that conflict kind of escalated over time, gold came back down. If we look at treasury yields and if they continue to surge higher, as a lot of people are predicting, it spells a bearish argument for gold. Meanwhile, just in the last few days or last few sessions, we've come back off of that oversold condition to not yet an overbought condition, but coming you know, back up to the, the top of the range here on the slow stochastics. We're also right on the 21 and approaching the 34-day moving averages, which would be likely reversal points. So I think there is an argument, despite the fact that it makes no sense to me, because I think gold should be much higher on both the expectation that we will eventually see a, a the force of a dovish pivot from the Fed, but also on the expectation of growing geopolitical tension. So I think gold ought to be much higher. But if I look at what's happened the last few times, I thought that we got a bounce on the geopolitical event, then it rolled back over. So the rollback over point ought to be right around 1900 or so, just above 1900. Let's see what happens. Yeah, Eric, when you're saying a question whether it lasts, to me, uh, it's obviously a bit of geopolitics, but really it's the dollar pullback that uh, has uh, allowed uh, gold to have a, a chance to revert and take a breather from that heavy selling. As we approach this 1900 to 1920 area, on, uh, I have that 50-day moving average on that chart. It's um, a place where uh, if there is going to be more selling in gold, this would act as a key overhead resistance. I, uh, in the bigger picture, am quite bullish gold, but uh, this is not the stage of the cycle where gold should be bulling yet. And so my uh, first uh, kind of call on this is that it's going to bump its head here. And uh, whether it has uh, only a marginal further downside risk, uh, I still think that the opportunity to really load up on gold is uh, at some point later this uh, quarter, if not in the first quarter of next year. I'll be looking for that buy on dip, but uh, I'm going to be a little patient on it. The last thing I wanted to touch on, though, on page nine, I have the uh, CME watch tool looking at uh, what is the probability of a rate hike now going into the November 1st uh, Fed meeting. And that has now uh, jumped uh, or sorry, dropped to 11 percent and 80 or better than an 88 percent chance that the Fed rem, uh, remains unchanged as there's now slowly talk that the Fed may actually pause as financial conditions have tightened sufficiently. Um, It will be interesting to see whether or not this uh, continues to materialize and whether or not that indicates uh, that uh, we're very close to a pivot or maybe months away from a pivot. Uh, And that's where on page 10, I want to watch that two-year note uh, futures. And you can see there's been nothing but relentless selling as uh, the Fed has been uh, raising rates and the two-year yield has uh, uh, cleared 5%. But the downside momentum has stalled, and it's really creating a bit of a basing formation. And if uh, the market really starts to sniff out uh, that there might be a new easing cycle at some point in the future, or at least even if the Fed is done, it'll be really interesting to see whether or not we start seeing uh, new bullish price action here, which, by the way, on this chart has not appeared yet. And so this is just one of those things that I'm watching closely because I think there might be an interesting opportunity that develops there. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. 
Well, in this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the chart deck that we just discussed here in the post game, including a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>